have your tickets ready. <laughs> Four o'clock show, please keep the line moving. Have your tickets ready. It's something you just can't really express in words. I just want to like turn around several times during the movie and just look out over the crowd. And also that part like uh, right after a long time ago in the galaxy far, far away where the there's silence. that pause yeah. and then boom. I remember Star Wars came out when I was in elementary school, and uh, one of the key things that I remember my friends talking about was, this is a really cool creature. The point that would always be brought up would be that wouldn't it be great if we actually saw that move? So when I first heard that we were restoring and adding effects to, to the uh, Tatooine Dune sequence, and one of the things that we were going to be doing was um, making one of these dewbacks move, it was kind of like, okay, sure. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> in the original movie, in order to get dewbacks and things into the movie, we built uh, a large rubber uh, mannequin, really, that we were able to move around from set to set. Uh, he had a big uh, stick in his head that somebody could sit alongside and move the head back and forth, and that was about as much movement as I could get out of it. Um, you know, it was a very crude thing. I tried, again, to get as much, as many different kinds of spaceships, robots, vehicles, animals as I could possibly fit into the movie. Um, and I was always very frustrated about the fact that I couldn't get the do-backs to actually move or do anything. They were just basically big rubber statues. On a typical film, when Island's working on shots, we may have anywhere from 50 to sometimes 1,200 shots in a film. It helps not to just give them numbers because it's a little hard to keep track that you're working on shot 437. How is that different from shot 512? So instead, usually they're broken down by sequences. So in this, in Star Wars, we took the Tatooine Dune sequence and the first three shots that came in were TD1 for Tatooine Dune, TD1, TD2, and TD3. TD3 was actually an existing shot, and what that was was a, uh, a puppet of a dewback on the berm up on the hill on the horizon. And uh, George was never happy with that. Um, he wanted the dewbacks to be more articulate. If you look at the shot, as it existed in the original Star Wars, it's kind of buffered by two transition points. I think what happens is you have a clockwise wipe that goes from a sand crawler shot into the Tatooine Dune shot. Someone was in the pod. The tracks go off in this direction. Look, sir, droids. And then you have an iris out shot back to another miniature photography shot. So right away, we realized that we weren't dealing necessarily with live action. What we were dealing with was um, an element that was at one time or another brought down to an optical house, recomped to, to add the transition. So what was in the movie was not the original footage. When I started the picture, this shot was missing. TD3 was missing. Here we are in the Lucasfilm archives, which houses all the material shot for every Lucasfilm production, beginning with THX 1138. This is where the search for the trooper in the desert sequence began, starting with the Star Wars work print material, which Tom Christopher, the editor, had already removed into his cutting room. There he was able to identify which elements he thought would be useful in remaking the effect, and it was my job after that to start a search for the negative. I started out as an editor, so to me, you know, saving the film, the film is what the whole process is about, and uh, so I've saved all my films, I've saved all the negative, I've saved everything, uh, partly because I'm a pack rat and partly because as an editor, I just don't want to throw those things out because I never know when I might want to go back and go back into it again. To look for the negative, I had to come here to our cold storage vault, which houses all the negative Fort Willow, indie movies, Empire, and finally we get to the Star Wars area, which is where I had to go digging for the trooper in the desert negative. So what happened is we went through all these boxes. We were not able to find the one that was actually used to make the effect. So as Tim Fox and company was looking for the select negative at the ranch, we continued to possibly find ways to use the outtakes. Here's the outtakes 
uh, I think there are around approximately six shots. But for one reason or another, uh, it became apparent that it wasn't as good as a select take. There, there are certain things that I'm sure Mr. Lucas didn't necessarily want the audience to see. For example, this guy turns his head, and you can see through the mask. Several people wanted to actually go and try to shoot this shot over. That, that, was, a, that was a real theory. Just before it was scanned, we, we found the O-neg, the original neg that went into the shot. All this material was discovered at ILM. And this had been sitting, unbeknownst to anybody, on top of their cold storage vault. And it was just by luck somebody found it. And inside, sure enough, was the select slate. Tom Christopher's group up there was able to locate all the original negative, because George had fortunately kept all the pieces. And so we had to additionally rewash every piece of negative that way, too, so we could recomp these. So that immediately took all the dirt problems that were built into the opticals out. All the splices were backed up with tape, and it was put through a processing machine again to loosen the emulsion and get as much of the embedded dirt and material that had been in there for 20 years off the negative so it would look a lot cleaner. Fortunately, because of the way the negative was cut, we were able to dissect the film. We double scrubbed and double rewashed these negatives. I know when people heard that we were doing this, they, they really sucked in their breath, you might say, <laughs> because this is, a, this is a classic. You don't want anything to happen to it. We cleaned that up, and immediately we got anywhere from a 65 to a 95 percent improvement. It gave us a groundwork to start from that was, that was clean and, and as good as we could get it. We were asked to take that shot as a plate and remove the rubber puppets so that we could put computer graphics generated puppets in. So in order to do that, what we had to do was scan that, turn it into a digital file, establish what the geometry probably was, what the size of a person was, what lens they probably used, so we could build the 3D space. Design work is, of course, a critical part of the process. And one of the things that was really important with the Dubacks was getting some really good drawings, which we had Terrell Whitlatch, one of our art directors, do. And her work w really helped us um, hone in on uh, the Dubac that we wanted to build. I had a really, really small still from a, a Star Wars book of the head of a Dubac. And I thought about, well, what is a Dubac like? You know, I started thinking about their personality, you know, and obviously how large they are, how heavy are they. That um, was pretty important, the sheer bulk of the creature. And how fast could it move? Then I thought, well, do they have, how many babies does it have? You know, how long do they live? You know, all kinds of thoughts like that. And um, I figured that it may have some um, characteristics like a camel, like a dromedary. And so I added some features like these calluses on the chest and on the elbows. I emphasize the hump up here on its neck a little bit because perhaps it's, it stores its fat because it has to go long periods of time without eating. It just has a thick rhinoceros-like skin and the feet have spongy pads like a camel's feet. I wanted to give a a kind of random um, real world feel to everything. So I wanted to do some things that weren't predictable, like having stormtroopers ride on dewbacks. Um, if you were to think about it very long, you would think, well, they'd be riding, you know, mechanized machines and things like that. But um, the idea was that uh, there was a creature like a dewback that existed in the desert, you know, like a lizard. Um, that was very adaptable to the desert and was actually much uh, better in terms of maintenance and upkeep than a m machine which the sand would get into and uh, you know it was very expensive to keep those machines going out there in the middle of the desert where the dewbacks are very cheap uh, to run and uh, they last a lot longer. When I said I wanted to add a couple of shots to the sequence um, uh, at first, we just thought, well, we'll go into the library, we'll get some shots of, of the dunes, and then we'll uh, just put some more, uh, you know, computer characters in there. And uh, then as I got more ambitious, I wanted to have stormtroopers, more stormtroopers, and, 
and they couldn't find any really good plates that were static that did what we wanted. And out of that came the decision that we really should go out and reshoot the plates. We had two CG do-backs, and uh, they kind of have a little dialogue together, uh, a little bit. And uh, he wanted to embellish that even more to show that the uh, troopers were actually riding around on those. So we added this, the two scenes before, TD-1, Tatooine Dunes 1 and 2. We gave ILM a time print of that reel, and they storyboarded it, matched it, and knew exactly what they were going to go out and shoot out there. Pre-visualization is key to visual effects because you're dealing with a situation where a very important part of your shot doesn't exist when you shoot it. So you have to do a lot of pre-planning. You have to understand where things are going to be in, you know, spatially and make a lot of the creative decisions that normally in live action photography you would make on the set and play around with and make them up front because you won't be able to see what you're getting on the set and if you don't think about that ahead of time you can paint yourself into a big corner. The first thing that we had to do was build geometry that was going to represent certain parts of the scene. For example, the dewback that the artist Terrell Whitlack designed. Uh, we can see in this three-dimensional modeling program that uh, we have front, top, and side views and a camera view of what this creature is going to look like. This will allow us to, this will allow the computer to calculate what each surface of this creature is going to look like from different camera angles. The next step was to bring the elements, the 3D model elements, into a three-dimensional animation rendering program. And in that, we can set up virtual lights, virtual cameras, and virtual objects to duplicate what would happen on a real set. You can see that it's extremely rough here, and it goes into more and more refined stages of animation. We went through a few versions of this Stormtrooper in the desert shot uh, in order to get all the action down the way they liked. When you're directing a movie and you have a, a cowboy on a horse and you say, OK, a little bit to the left, now, okay, now run forward, and you look at it through the camera, and you say, okay, that's great, that's a rehearsal. Um, uh, this time, you know, come a little bit closer to the camera, start a little back, move to the left, and uh, about halfway through, sort of rein your horse up a little bit. That's the normal way you direct, and you keep doing takes and takes until you sort of get it the way you want it to be. Uh, with, with computer technology and doing scenes that are basically done in a computer, you need to be able to have that same feedback in the process of creating the shot and framing the shot and, and deciding whether it's going too fast, too slow, too close to the camera, too far away. Um, and that's what this whole low-res pre-visualization aspect of it is. It's a way for the director to actually see the shot, nail down the shot and say, okay, that's the way I want it. It was wonderful to be able to, to rely on David Desorts to, to be able to take something, a concept that, you know, was often just scribbled on paper and make a shot up that could then be critiqued four or five times by George and myself. And we could make the thing fit into the mold of the, of the scene. One of the big challenges of, of dealing with the Tatooine Dune sequence was uh, we had to match um, uh, new photography with old photography. The original shot, the pan across the landscape, the stormtrooper coming up with a little gasket saying, look, sir, droid. So the original look of all of that, um, we had to match that um, with our two new shots. We had to match the quality of the landscape. We also had to match the look of the filtration and the way the lens is flaring and the highlights look in the old shot that we had to duplicate. The first thing that was very apparent was the glare on the Stormtrooper. And if we were trying to match two new shots within the same sequence to something shot 20 years ago, we had to, we had to find out exactly how that glare was produced. And um, <clears throat> one way to do that was through going through the continuity reports. The paperwork gave us information pertaining to lens, focal length, T-stops, and also the type of netting that was used to produce this effect. Unlike a restoration project like Wizard of Oz or Vertigo, uh, we had George. And one of the first things George pointed out was, I remember this shot. And I remember 
um, aesthetically, he had a he had a reason for adding a filter uh, specifically for this type of glare, and that was he wanted it to be hot, and he wanted the the uh, audience to, to know that this was not a very comfortable setting. In the summer of uh, 1995, I got a call uh, out of Rick McCallum's office, a request actually, that uh, several of the old Stormtrooper costumes needed to be pulled for Star Wars the Special Edition. I told Rick, I guess at one point, the story of how I was always really jealous of uh, my two best friends in high school who were friends with Ben Burt, the Scylla brothers. And I was always a step behind John Silla, who was a valedictorian of our class, and Ben recorded their voices. All pilots, stair station. All pilots, stair station. So for 20 years, it really bugged me that both of these guys got to be in Star Wars, and here I was working on it. So I told Rick about them being in it, and he said, and he, he called me up a few weeks later and said, well, what are your measurements? And I, I said, well, six feet. And I, I really didn't know what he was. I said, what's your weight? And I said, you know, 160. He said, well, that's, that's, I said, you know, I started wondering, what, what does he ask me? He says, oh, that's perfect, that's perfect, perfect. And he goes, well, are you, can you just reserve August 10th and 11th on your calendar? Are you going to be anywhere? We might just need a little, uh, an extra stormtrooper. I said, you know, my eyes, you know, I was on the phone with him. My eyes lit up and got stormtrooper. It's like, I said, yeah, yeah, you know, that those Scylla brothers, I think it's time that you, put to rest this, this grudge that you've been carrying. This is where we keep all of the uh, props, uh, costumes, map paintings, um, models, miniatures, creatures, puppets, and so forth for all the Lucasfilm productions throughout the years. And when, when the time came for me to find the Stormtrooper costumes, they were actually in a big trunk like this. These are all our original costumes and probably were the ones, some of the ones actually sent down for the reshoot. I think a creative decision was also made that it would be better to have the originals, the color of them to, would tend to match better to the original footage. This is a shoulder piece um, that the stormtroopers had to wear. And then these backpacks also had to be made or uh, to match more or less the original backpacks from the original footage in Star Wars. So I immediately started training. I drove out there with my little brother who I wanted to see me be a stormtrooper. That was also incredibly important that someone in my family witnessed me being a stormtrooper. It was a brutal shoot. One of the toughest that I've been on. I mean, it was it was a lot of fun because it was amazingly beautiful, and we got to ride around in dune buggies and you know charge through the desert. And we had uh, uh, U.S. Marines walking around in stormtrooper costumes in this blistering 120 degree heat. So it was it was a very exciting experience to be out there. Um, definitely felt like you were out on Tatooine in the middle of nowhere. I was very hot in that suit, and I was incredibly self-conscious because I was this 30-ish guy with all these Marines. Rick got them to put me in front, you know, with the binoculars, so fortunately I didn't have to move because I was not nearly as coordinated as the Marines, so I just had to sit there with my little binoculars and. And, and stand there and roast in the heat. Going out and shooting a plate is not a big deal uh, relative to the other things you do on a movie. Uh, even though you have a, a reasonably psychic screw, when you're actually out there, uh, you know, with the dune buggies and the, tr the troopers and the cameras and the people, it's a, it's a sizable and expensive operation. In the overall process of making a film, it's a very small unit. Here's the plate we shot in Arizona. We shot it oversized and included some tennis balls just so we can track our virtual camera to this plate. We're later going to crop in to a 235 crop, which is the aspect ratio of the film. Here, we're tracking our 3D computer graphics spheres to those tennis balls. And we also have some landmarks back there, some cones that are hopefully lock solid to some of the valleys. For us to lock this, that means the dewback is going to be locked to the sand and he won't be rubbing against the sand. If there's any sliding at all, it's going to give the gag away. 
This is uh, soft homage. This is what uh, we animate to do back in Trooper. And so that then gets painted and textured and lit. This is a very, very crude do back. Uh huh. Yeah, it's a little too long striding for uh, right. what we were thinking, but. All right. Well, we're getting there. And we like this, the way the Stormtrooper kind of waddle gets thrown back and forth. Yeah, no, I like that too. Yeah. The Stormtroopers, you know, in the pictures, they have these big long poles. Right. Yeah. Which one might assume are used to zap the thing on the head or something. <laughs> the first thing I do is I throw a plastic do back in the scene just to get them roughed out. It's just basically size and proportion. It'd probably be better if he was coming toward us. Okay. You know, if he was revealed just as that guy walked right. If you don't see him before, you don't see him before this guy, but as he's revealed, they. You know, about in, about in there. In here? And he, he, yeah, he's a little further away, but he's sort of coming toward us. Great. I then uh, apply what we call view paint. We can orient the dewback in any orientation, paint right on the dewback scales. I found this shot really easy to light in terms of the troopers because we had so much reference here. At the bottom of the frame, you've got some of the trooper shadows here, and you can see the direction of the sun. So I have to mimic my key light, my virtual key light, based on where I think the sun is. Eye shade allows me to place the lights where I want. So I, I'm getting this rim light here from the, the key light, actually. It's doing some nice effects on the, the top of the dewback and the back feet as well. And uh, I've got a bounce light in here as well, just to give it some ambient light. Here's the final comp. Here you can see I've added some star cross filters to mimic some of the work in the old footage. One of the things that was important to the original photography is that it had a very soft look, had that uh, sort of gauzy, kind of rich, almost dreamy quality, pantyhose over the lens, which you know, gives you those very distinctive four-cornered flares. If you look at the shots before they're treated with our, our pantyhose filter, you'll find that they're very crystal sharp, and it would be very jarring to see that kind of stuff cut in. Secondary animation is often added, so not only does it move and hit the ground, but when it hits the ground, its belly will jiggle, which sells the mass and weight of something like a dewback. I hope the sequence now establishes that there are more stormtroopers on the planet, that it's not just two or three stormtroopers, it's just actually a lot of them. The danger is greater, and uh, they're a more formidable element in the movie than they were before. The important thing about the Tatooine Dune sequence was that we were trying to make a story point in that the stormtroopers weren't a bunch of lamos that just spent five minutes looking for the droids and didn't find them. They actually got out there and conducted a full-scale search of the planet. And to make it a little, you know, increase the dramatic tension and the stakes and give more of a sense of a wider scope to the story that's being told. What I feel when I see it now is that uh, the Tatooine planet, okay, is being investigated by a, a, by a detachment of stormtroopers, which is, which is a line from the movie, basically, something that Vader says in Real One. She must have hidden the plans in the escape pod. Send a detachment down to retrieve them. See to it personally, Commander. There'll be no one to stop us this time. Yes, sir. One of the original difficulties with that particular sequence was that it involves wipes. And when the wipes were originally made, they had not fine-tuned the color correction from the A, or the beginning side of the wipe, to the B. So the timer in 1977 had no choice but to put a bump in the middle of that wipe. When the negative cutter has finished assembling all the scenes as they need to be in the final process, we then make sure that all the correct light points and everything have been inserted for both the old material and the new material that we get from both Pacific Tidal and ILM. The idea was to make sure that the people that were compositing these new wipes knew exactly the color we wanted, the beginning of the shot and the end of the shot, so that when we got it all done, there wouldn't be any bumps. The goal here is to, is for the people that have seen it in the past in the theater, is for them not to see anything new other than maybe new characters or, or new additional scenes which were put in. 
but not to notice anything different that would strike them and say, whoa, what did they do here, or something like that. The idea is to, to make it as close to what they re originally remembered as possible. What I hope it is is something that's timeless, that it's, it's just a beautiful print, film print, of, of a great movie. When we decided that we would restore the films, and um, uh, I realized that then I had an opportunity to fix a lot of the problems that I had when I first finished the film. I looked at the film and began to pull all the old thorns out of my side, one of which was the dewbacks and the fact that the dewbacks couldn't walk. And I always wanted them to, uh, to have movement and walk around and be part of the, uh, the population of the film. Look, sir, Troy. 